Um, okay, so I wanted to uh, tell you about uh, some relatively recent results on uh, the application of uh, BVBFV formalism that you already uh, heard in the first talk to um, some new problems in quantum field theory, in particular to uh, the asymptotic structure. Okay, so this uh, talk is based on the joint work with Michele Schiavina, so this is, you can find it on the archive, so if you're interested to hear more, um, you can look it up. All right, so uh, let's get started. I will tell you first a bit about BVBFV, just, you know, very broadly because uh, most of you are super familiar with that. Um, then uh, something which is maybe less known in for this audience, asymptotic quantum electrodynamics, and then our results on charges and symmetries. Okay, so first of all, uh, the VVBAV data. So uh, we have a manifold M, so we have bulk manifold and we assign to it um, the following pieces of data, F, omega, S, and Q. Um, and here, uh, F, omega, is minus one symplectic graded manifold. So this is the space of fields F with a minus one shifted uh, symplectic form. Uh, we also have a degree zero action functional S and we have uh, an odd vector field Q on F, which is of degree one and satisfies the known uh, cohomological property. So commutator Q if Q is zero. And now, so this is the, so, so to say BV data, now BFV data uh, also assigns stuff to the boundary. So to the boundary of M, we assign also uh, four pieces of data. And those are boundary fields uh, with uh, an exact uh, zero shifted symplectic uh, form. So this was already uh, mentioned before. Um, and now uh, we also have a boundary action as partial on F partial. Um, and we also have uh, an odd vector field Q uh, boundary on F boundary. And this is also of degree one and also satisfies the cohomological property. Okay, so, so far so good. We have these two pieces of data, but obviously we want them to be connected in a way. So there is a map from fields uh, in the bulk to the fields of uh, the boundary. Um, and it has to satisfy certain properties. So um, first of all, so the first property is an obvious generalization of uh, what we would have without the boundary. So insertion of the vector field Q into that one form gives uh, delta S. So Q uh, well, plus uh, pullback from of the one form from the boundary. Um, so uh, Q is almost a Hamiltonian vector field, uh, but not quite. And this failure is given by uh, the boundary uh, symplectic form. And we have, uh, well, an obvious formula uh, for the double insertion. And uh, finally, we have uh, a corresponding formula for uh, the omega on the boundary and Q boundary together with uh, the formula with the double insertion. Okay, so, and we could stop here, but we can also continue. So if we have things like corners, then we can also assign data to corners and go well as high as we can, uh, depending on what sort of structure we are uh, building on. So uh, we can continue that uh, tower of of uh, structures and identities uh, and get some higher cohomological data. Okay, so that was the crash course in BVBFV. Now, uh, the generalization we looked at with Michele was to uh, now use this machinery to uh, the case where this uh, boundary of M is not really a boundary of, of something, something finite, but it's rather, uh, boundary at infinity. So we are looking at the asymptotic data rather than boundary data. So what does it mean? Well, okay, so we want to be able to describe in this nice mathematical framework that V is um, asymptotic observables and 
uh, symmetries. And the motivation for that, well, there are several motivations. So uh, first of all, okay, so we want to use that gadget to uh, derive conservation of asymptotic charges from vanishing of the boundary action. So uh, this is kind of straightforward that this should work. Um, we also want to have some nice description for observables and symmetries using this homological algebra language. I will explain why is that so crucial in this context. And finally, we want to prepare ground for quantization because well, classical theory is nice, but what we eventually want to do is to quantize it. So this work uh, up to now, this is uh, on the classical structure, but because we managed to fit everything into this BVBFV language, one knows uh, how to go about quantizing it. Okay, so what is the big deal with asymptotic quantization? Well, so first of all, this was proposed for uh, quantum gravity and quantum electrodynamics. Um, and well, I think the person who started that whole business was by Ashtaka. So a lot of this was done in the 80s. Um, so the idea was to try to understand uh, the asymptotic degrees of freedom in gravity. We know that, well, graviton is supposed to be massless, so it has long range um, effects. The same situation happens in QED because photon is also massless. And in QED, these ideas were picked up in the 90s by Andrzej Herdegen from the University of Krakow. And uh, this is where I encountered it. So uh, Herdegen was my master thesis advisor. So this is when I started working on this. Um, and yeah, so he did quite a lot on that subject. At that time, so this was a while ago, um, this wasn't really a hot thing. Now it became a hot thing recently. So uh, there was a series of works by uh, Andrew Strominger and his collaborators um, including the one which I want to focus on here, so New Symmetries of QED from 2015. And the big idea was to kind of connect various things. So uh, these asymptotic symmetries, asymptotic charges were then connected to Weinberg. So photon theorem, you don't have to know what this is. This is something in quantum field theory and so-called memory effects. And there is a claim that uh, that structure in quantum gravity can be used to explain things like quantum information paradox, which is pretty cool if it works. Okay, so, um, you know, this asymptotic quantization got a bit of revival. And here, a little controversy popped up. So, um, there was a later paper by Herdegen in 2016, Asymptotic Structure of Electrodynamics Revisited, where he questions the status of these large gauge transformations, so these asymptotic uh, gauge symmetries, he questions their status as symmetries. Because he's saying, well, these cannot really be symmetries because these things do not preserve asymptotic structure. We'll see later, they do not preserve uh, the symplectic form. All right, so, uh, but if you just, you know, go with the usual Nitter procedure for these transformations and uh, well, the, the physics thing, so don't care about the rigor too much for a while, uh, then you get the right formulae. So this is great. So something must be going on behind it. And this is what we thought with Michele. Um, and we wanted to answer the question, are these LGTs uh, symmetries or not? What's the status of those guys? Uh, what are they mathematically? And well, we found out that uh, actually, in order to understand this full story, one needs to uh, use the, the full uh, framework of BVBFV, and one needs to look into uh, higher data. So it will uh, turn out that uh, the right way of describing such system is the bulk, the boundary, and the corner data. So um, the punchline of this talk is that, uh, well, this maybe slightly abstract formalism and this higher data can actually be used in something very practical. And uh, in our opinion, this resolves the controversy about the status of large gauge symmetries as symmetries of the structure. So um, I will come back to this point at the very end. So um, 
before I can uh, say that, I need to introduce the whole machinery. So uh, bear with me. I'm going to lead you through asymptotic uh, QED and uh, show you where things fit into the framework that some of you are very familiar with. All right, so um, let's start with uh, Minkowski space time. So the thing uh, here, the diagram uh, is in fact uh, Minkowski space time in, uh, well, this kind of presenting uh, space time is, is called a conformal diagram. So let me first uh, describe to you what these things are. So, okay, so you can imagine that this triangle is kind of compactification of Minkowski spacetime. So this vertical line represents um, radius equals zero, R equals zero. Um, so this is the, the space like uh, direction radius. And now uh, time goes upwards. So uh, we have so I zero here is uh, the space lag infinity. So this direction you go uh, to space lag infinity. Upwards there is I plus, which is future infinity. And downwards there is I minus, which is the past infinity. And the boundaries here are uh, scry, the null infinity, which consists of two pieces. So there is the past null infinity and there is the future now null infinity. Uh, do you see the pointer when, when I'm pointing or? Yes, we see it. Okay, great. Um, okay, so now I want to assign some variables there. So QED, okay. Well, I'm doing scalar QED because I don't want to bother with fermions at the moment. Uh, so this is done uh, in the model where the photon field is coupled to a complex scalar, but this can be easily generalized. Uh, okay, so uh, yeah, so we work on Minkowski spacetime and uh, photons uh, here I denote by A. So they are one forms on uh, Minkowski spacetime. And I want a particular fall off condition. So I want them to fall off as one over R when R is essentially, um, well, uh, it's a parameter which uh, I will explain in a minute, uh, quantifies uh, how far have you gone in a null direction. So photons uh, live on uh, future null infinity and past null infinity. So all the radiation uh, goes along the null, null directions. Um, matter fields, uh, on the other hand, uh, don't. So they live at future and past uh, infinity. So you can think of, uh, you know, matter fields kind of propagating from uh, infinite past to infinite future. Um, and uh, these are, in this case, uh, complex scalar fields. Um, Okay, and now I want to be able to uh, describe this using the BV setting. So uh, first of all, I need to uh, set up the theory at the finite region where I can construct the bulk and boundary in the usual sense. I can uh, then uh, do appropriate scaling transformation and send things uh, to infinity. So the idea is that I start with BV, BFV in the finite region, which I can nicely describe, and then I send things to infinity. So here is the model I'm using. This is the picture uh, here at the bottom. So I have something which consists of null uh, boundaries and a time lag boundary. So this here is uh, the null boundary which I, um, for a good reason, denote by scry plus r and scry minus r. So r is uh, going to be, uh, it's, it's the, the radial coordinate, which is going to be eventually uh, sent to infinity. And then at the top of and the bottom 
of this region. I close it with these little bits of a hyperboloid. So this is uh, parameterized by the hyperbolic time. So this is when I send this region to infinity, this is going to be the um, future uh, time lag infinity. This is going to be the past time lag infinity. And uh, those null guys are going to be the scry. So you can imagine how this works. And now um, I want to construct first the theory at this finite region. OK, so uh, I also want to uh, parameterize the uh, fields, my uh, variables, in a way which is going to be convenient for that. So uh, here I'm using the variables that Herdigan introduced in his paper from 95. So um, I want uh, these asymptotic fields to be functions of null directions because they live at null infinity. So um, I'm going to, so here is a picture of a light cone. I start uh, at the uh, tip of the light cone. And so L is now null direction. So you can imagine the whole light cone of null directions starting at a point. And now going to null infinity is moving along that uh, null ray. So I have a parameter R, which uh, then when it goes to infinity, then I uh, end up at the null boundary. And uh, I also need to know where exactly I stand on that light cone. So I take the intersection of my light cone with um, some time lag plane with a time lag vector t, which uh, tells me um, well the orientation of that plane and the intersection of these two things, so the light cone and the time lag plane given in terms of t, um, is going to be a two sphere. So the intersection here is s two. Hope this works. Okay. Um, so there will be two. Uh, variables in the game uh, for the asymptotic field. So R goes infinity, forget R. So at infinity, we are uh, going to deal with S and L. So S is going to uh, parameterize where exactly we are at that uh, null infinity and uh, L is going to parameterize the uh, null direction. I will show you another picture soon. OK, so as I said, null asymptotics is obtained by taking r going to infinity. OK, so I'm not going to talk about uh, the matter fields because uh, I have uh, limited time here. So uh, let me just briefly describe you uh, the BV data. Uh, again, uh, for some of you, it is very familiar. Uh, you have also seen uh, some BVBFV in the previous talk. Uh, so yeah, so the standard thing to do, well, the bulk fields are kind of obvious. So we have uh, fields A and corresponding fields, uh, sorry, corresponding anti-fields A uh, double dagger. So the shifted symplectic form has, you know, a term for each pair of field anti-field. So there are the photons, there are the ghosts, um, and there is the, the, the scalar field and its conjugate. So, so far, so good. And uh, BV extended action starts with uh, the usual suspect, which uh, is just the action for the photon field. And then there is uh, the coupling to uh, matter. And here, uh, DA phi da phi bar are uh, the covariant derivatives. OK, so now um, there are also some anti-fields term, which I omitted from uh, this slide. Uh, you can essentially figure them out by looking how the uh, BV operator Q acts on things. So it implements the gauge transformation, as uh, you know a decent BV operator should do. So it acts on A um, as uh, the covariant derivative of the 
a ghost, which then gets evaluated on the gauge parameter. Um, and then there is the obvious transformation law for uh, the matter fields, which matches that the theory is nicely gauge invariant. There are also here um, the corresponding formulae for the action on anti fields as well. So that's the standard law. And now if we denote by J the, the matter current, we can write down the equations of motion that come out of that business. So there is the one for the photon field, uh, which in the leading order has box on A uh, term. So the Lambertian, the wave operator, uh, things we understand very well. And on the right hand side, you have the matter current. And there are also equations for the matter fields. Um, and the current is conserved on shell, which is also what we expect to be true. Uh, now, because we are doing all this asymptotic business, we also have to assume some fall off conditions. So for us, uh, the, the right condition for the uh, matter current is to uh, fall off like the uh, hyperbolic time to minus three to match the fall off conditions for uh, the photon field. So that there is nice asymptotic structures for both matter fields and uh, and photons. Okay, so uh, the boundary data. Now, uh, you can again think of this as something first of all living on the uh, finite boundary, but then um, in uh, the limit where I take my finite region, uh, I, I blow it up to infinity. This is living on um, the asymptotic boundary. So the boundary action, uh, well, this is the formula. It has two terms. So C is the ghost field. Um, you see that because of you know D here, you end up integrating on the boundary of M, in this case, asymptotic boundary. And you have one term where you just have the coupling uh, of um, the photon field. And you have one term where you have the coupling of the ghost to the matter current. And this uh, kind of structure, this falling into these two terms, is going to be uh, relevant later on. Uh, there is uh, the boundary symplectic form. You can easily get it by you know restricting fields to the boundary. This is, again, nothing new. Um, and the BFV operator, as one requires, uh, is the Hamiltonian vector field for the boundary action. So also great. And uh, now let me come back to uh, the derivation of the asymptotic fields. We introduced some variables and some uh, notations so we can finally write things down a bit more concretely. So uh, asymptotic variables for uh, the photon fields for uh, the gauge potentials as I said, these are supposed to fall off like 1 over r. So the correct limit is to take the limit of r times a, where we kind of take this limit along a null ray. And we obtain something which uh, I'm using original Herdegen's notation, uh, which uh, for some reason um, is referring to those asymptotic fields as v's. So V is a guy who lives on uh, scry, so on this, this boundary here. So S is a parameter which tells you where exactly you are on uh, this boundary. So here we have S equals plus infinity at future infinity. At past infinity, we have S equals minus infinity. So it kind of runs along scry. And L is something you don't see on that picture. Um, so it's going to be uh, the null direction, uh, which uh, is an element of S2. So we have, so these are functions on S2 cross R. Um, OK, so this is, so V is the asymptotic at, uh, well, future uh, null infinity. Uh, there is also a corresponding thing 
or pass null infinity, and again, for some reason, these are denoted by V prime. Okay. Um, I got a bit confused with all uh, this loading and uploading. Uh, when do I finish? So we have uh, like 15 minutes left. Okay, great. Uh, that's, that's very good. Uh, okay, so I can make a few remarks about uh, the interpretation of these things. So, uh, okay, so we have um, asymptotic variables living on scry. Um, and now there's a bit of physics here, I'm, I'm sorry. Uh, so if we don't have matter current, so if uh, J equals zero, so we have uh, just a wave equation, solutions to the wave equation um, go nicely uh, just onto this uh, null boundary. So there is, so here at I minus and I plus, I have corners. You can imagine that each of these points is actually an S2. Uh, so if I don't have matter fields in the game, then nothing is propagating to uh, future time lag infinity and past time lag infinity, which means that uh, these values at the corner of my asymptotic fields are zero. So think of each point here as uh, representing an S2. It's, very, huh, it's not very easy to draw here, but yeah, so this is S2. Okay. Uh, so now I want to describe, so that was the variables, now I want to describe the gauge transformations, and uh, the interesting ones are those who actually do something uh, interesting to um, our asymptotic structure. So uh, this is, okay, th this is pretty straightforward, but uh, one has to be a bit careful not to uh, require too much on these poor guys, because uh, you might uh, overload them a bit. So uh, we start with a gauge potential in the Lorentz gauge because Lorentz is, is a very cool gauge. You can do things with it. Um, and we apply a gauge transformation in which we modify that uh, by adding d lambda, where lambda is our gauge parameter. And we want this to do something interesting to uh, the asymptotes of A. Um, we produce a different asymptote of A hat. So I have to assume some fall-off conditions. Uh, and it turns out, OK, so um, D lambda should have uh, asymptotics 1 over R. So lambda should have, uh, well, the leading term should be constant in R. So it should just depend on the uh, null direction. Um, and uh, I will use the notation where this is denoted by epsilon plus. So that d lambda is then 1 over r uh, times uh, the asymptote of d lambda, which I denote by v epsilon plus. Um, and here there is a requirement which I'm kind of uh, hiding in a way. So uh, recall that these v's were functions on S2. So this is where L lives. Uh, cross R. So there was an extra parameter uh, S, which corresponded to uh, the exact position on um, on scry. And here, I assume that uh, my the epsilons are independent of that parameter. This is a non-trivial assumption. Um, I also want lambda to satisfy Laplace equation uh, on the hyperboloid at uh, time like infinity. So let me just again come back to this picture here. So as I said, uh, here the uh, I plus can be thought of as um, a hyperboloid, which then 
uh, touches Scry at a corner, which is S2. So I want to be able to reconstruct the data uh, at the hyperboloid at future and past time lag infinity using the corner data, uh, which then connects what I have to um, the asymptotic uh, null structure. So uh, there is there is a lot there is a lot of um, dimensions hidden in that picture. Uh, so yeah, so that's another requirement. So uh, I want to have uh, some nice behavior uh, of lambda at the hyperboloid. And finally, uh, I want to require some matching conditions at space like infinity, so the asymptote at um, at uh, scry plus and the asymptote at scry minus match at the point where they meet. Okay, so they meet here at I zero, and they should be uh, continuous through there. Okay, so that's my wish list. What else do I want? Well. Okay, so uh, obviously I want these things to be well defined because, uh, yeah, uh, we are doing some mathematics after all. And now here's the thing. So this is an observation also due to Herdegen that if I want non-trivial um, asymptotic uh, transformations here, which uh, satisfy all uh, these conditions I listed, then uh, this adding of d lambda has to necessarily change the gauge. So uh, if I started with A in the Lorentz gauge, then A hat uh, cannot be in the Lorentz gauge. This is a bit of a pain because uh, ideally we would like this to be true. Unfortunately, this doesn't work. This is something which was uh, omitted in the literature somehow. Um, but uh, yeah, it's a subtlety of uh, how wave equations behave. Uh, so this was one of the reasons why Herdegen said that, well, since uh, these transformations kind of bring you to a different sector of the theory in his sense, then um, they are not really symmetries of the structure. And more importantly, uh, they do not preserve the symplectic structure on, um, on the boundary. So they they are not really uh, compatible with the symplectic structure for these, these asymptotic fields V. But here is a piece of good news, which uh, I think is a great thing about BV that we can understand uh, those things much better. It turns out that the failure to uh, preserve the symplectic structure at the boundary is governed exactly by the data assigned to the corner. So, um, the corner is S2, and you have uh, corner fields um, living on uh, S2, both copies of S2 at both ends of uh, the boundary. And it turns out that this uh, failure is governed exactly by that date. Let me say a bit more about this. Um, I need to introduce some formulas in order to uh, make this happen. So uh, here is our dear friend, the boundary action. And uh, I'm using exactly the same formula as before. I made a little modification, a little trick to uh, write um, this term here in a slightly nicer way. Uh, so this is the remark below. There are two ways of presenting it, and one is kind of nicer. Um, so there is going to be one term uh, with just the uh, electromagnetic potential, which, uh, you know, matching with literature is called um, the soft contribution. Um, so this is a terminology from, from uh, particle physics that uh, things involving matter are sort of hard and just the photons are called soft. Uh, so this is going to be the soft contribution, and the one uh, involving the current is going to be the hard um, contribution to the boundary action. And so for the first one, you have something which lives on uh, the null uh, boundary, so like D 
these bits. And for the second, you have uh, something which lives on uh, the time lag surface and goes to the hyperboloid at infinity. Okay, uh, let me just very briefly give you an impression of how these things are calculated. So I will just give you the calculation for uh, the soft charge. So we start with uh, the source wave equation. Uh, we know the existence of retarded and advanced green functions. And now we do the standard thing in uh, QED. We can split the solution into um, a solution to the inhomogeneous problem, give it by the retarded uh, green function plus incoming fields, which are then solutions to the homogeneous problem. Uh, and similarly, we can do this with advanced and outgoing fields. Um, and then we can compute uh, the soft contribution as, uh, now there are two pieces. So one piece is going to be at scry plus, another at scry minus. So I have two contributions one uh, living on scry plus and the other on scry minus. And if I compute things uh, explicitly, then I find the following. So I find that there is a term coming from uh, the asymptotics of DC. So this was, so now, now I computed for, for the ghost field, but obviously it can be evaluated at any gauge parameter lambda satisfying our fall off conditions. So this is, that term and the other term is just the asymptotic outgoing electromagnetic field. So this is the second factor and both are integrated over S2. Okay, so, and this I identify as the soft charge at scry plus. And then similarly, I can uh, compute the soft charge at scry minus. I can do the same kind of magic also for the hard charges. So now I analyze the term which has the coupling to the current. Uh, again, I have two contributions, one on the uh, plus infinity hyperboloid and the other at minus infinity. Um, I require some matching conditions at uh, space lag infinity so that things go nicely continuously through there. And then I get um, the total charge uh, as the sum of uh, the soft charge and the hard charge. And then finally, uh, as the key result, uh, the boundary, the vanishing of the boundary action on shell is then implies that this total charge uh, at uh, plus infinity equals the total charge at minus infinity. So this is like the first thing we wanted to show. So that really, you know, the usual law of uh, the boundary action vanishing on shell uh, gives you uh, the charge conservation if you identify those uh, pieces in the appropriate way. Um, and here is something better. Uh, it also allows us to deal with that little controversy whether things are symmetries or not. Um, so here we have uh, the boundary uh, symplectic structure um, living at the asymptotic boundary. And if we now insert to this uh, Q boundary evaluated at a gauge parameter, which is a large gauge transformation, so has these correct fall-off conditions and matching conditions and everything we like, um, then well, this doesn't vanish, this is equal to um, something which naturally lives in the corner because you see you have an integral over the boundary of uh, total derivative of something. So this lives in the corner and we can then uh, identify this right hand side with uh, the pullback of a canonical one form omega corner, which is uh, something uh, defined for uh, the corner fields. So there is a lot of um, uh, partial derivatives here. So F, so here we have F uh, corner uh, is uh, essentially the, the data assigned to S2. So uh, 
to, to the boundary of scry. Okay, so, and if we make that identification, then we can finally write um, that the failure of the symplectic form at the boundary to be uh, gauge invariant under those large gauge transformations, uh, that's exactly what one uh, would expect in the BV language, so it's the pullback of the corner form. Um, so, yeah, so we can say, uh, well, that at least explains the status of um, large ga gauge transformations um, as symmetries in this more generalized sense where we take the higher uh, data into account. But also it gives us a, a nice way to quantize things. So instead of doing the usual asymptotic quantization with just the boundary data, uh, we can use the full BVBFV machinery and quantize the data, including the corners to get a consistent picture. So this is work in progress, but we hope to uh, be able to present something soon. Okay, so thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much. Is there a question here? Hello. So I have a sort of a literature question. So oh. it was 20 years ago, there was a detailed paper by Barnich and Brandt uh -huh. on the structure of asymptotic symmetries, charges. And uh, when this new wave started, uh, thanks to Strominger, I think Mark and Noe and uh, Cedric Tossard had a series of papers on uh, all these asymptotic symmetries in QED and gravity. So could you please tell a few words about the relation to these papers, if you know them? Yeah, yeah, so, I mean, uh, we're using here, uh, well, I mean, th there are uh, a few differences. So, um, I think this, uh, right, so there are some subtleties about uh, the um, uh, analytic story, so, um, about the structure of the uh, s solution spaces for wave equations that uh, were, well, not not really uh, discussed in these works. So um, I think here the crucial uh, difference is that uh, we define um, the spaces of these asymptotic fields a bit more carefully, uh, just to avoid potential problems with, you know, if you impose um, all these uh, conditions for the asymptotic structure, you might end up uh, working on on an empty space. Uh, so, so I would like to point out uh, this uh, particular uh, issue that if you assume uh, both the original and the transformed field to be in the Lorentz gauge, then you find out that uh, if you also want to have well-defined asymptotics, then you don't have matching conditions at uh, space like infinity, so you cannot really compute uh, the charge. So there are some subtleties there, and um, well, the works you mentioned, they uh, at least, <laughs> well, well, at least they are assuming the Lorentz gauge. I don't know if they need the Lorentz gauge, um, but there is some caution required, I think. Okay, thank you very much. Is there maybe a question from the online participants? Just unmute yourself. I would okay. like to ask a okay. question. Please go ahead. I can ask. <laughs> Hi. Um, is there a relation to this concept of Buchholz on restricting uh, observations to light cones? This yeah, distinction that's between the soft charge and the hard charge uh, looks a little bit uh, like this. One would hope so. So, uh, yeah, th th thanks for the question. Uh, so, 
yeah, we would like to, you know, run the usual um, BVBFV quantization machinery and see if if that matches uh, well with with the ideas of uh, Wuhold and Roberts. Um, so yeah, that's the hope. Um, it was always kind of um, well, you know, works of Herdegan, right? So um, I, I think his ideas about uh, the quantization of the asymptotic structures were always with, in a bit of tension with um, the more traditional AQFT because uh, they assume some sort of non-locality. So the mm -hmm, point mm -hmm. is that here you are working with some kind of non-locality because you have the bulk fields and you have boundary fields and you have uh, some sort of consistency relations between those. So I, I think it would be interesting to, to understand, I mean, how, how these two things match, because um, up to now there has been a bit of tension. Uh, what, what's the right way of, of describing uh, the asymptotic structure? But yeah, good, good thing to try. 